driving through Harper County, and this was by about maybe a month and a half ago now, and as I was driving through, it's up on Dublin Road, uh, an area I've just never been in, I never had any need to go to Street, Maryland, and as, as I was up there, I came across that old broken down church, and, and what, you see broken down churches occasionally, and it's a sad thing, it's one less voice in the community, I would rather see a church in every corner than broken down churches, and so I, I drove by it, and I said, oh man, I wonder what happened to that church, it's fascinating. But, but what really caught me in the irony of it all was the name of the church, Herald of Hope Baptist Church. Like, um, you know, when you name something, you kind of talk about your vision and your hope and you, what you want to do. And this church, we're, we're claiming to be the message of hope in our community. Come check us out. We're weed infested, boarded up, and inaccessible. And then I kind of, as I was going through that and praying through that and thinking about that and thinking about this church, I was just like, man, we, we've got to be people who are heralds of hope. Because hope feels gone in the world where we live. And I've had too many conversations about people who, have, who are depressed, it's anxiety-ridden, thoughts of suicide, attempts of suicide. I mean, just some really hard stuff right now in our culture. Some really difficult things people are dealing with. And I think it's because there is this general sense of, of hopelessness. That we're missing out on hope. And so this sermon series has been just kind of walking through... Romans chapter 8, and just looking at what is the actual reason for hope? What is our reason for hope? Amongst the anxiety, the difficulties, the struggles, where can we find hope? And so we started out two weeks ago talking about the fact that we can have hope that we are forgiven. Romans chapter 8 begins with that verse, There is now, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I mean, that means that we can be forgiven completely and forever in Jesus Christ. And I think that's a good reason for hope. Like, you don't have to walk around wondering and, and with this weight of, am I right with God? Like, if you are finding your forgiveness and hope in Jesus Christ, if you come to him with repentance and asking for forgiveness, and you can know, you know, there, there are days where you feel far from, days where you feel close to him, but you are, you are condemnation-free in your life. That's a reason for hope, the forgiveness of God. Last week, we kind of delved into the idea of pain. Can there be hope in the middle of my pain? And we used Paul's words when he said, I consider the suffering, the, the present suffering, not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed. Meaning that the junk that you're going through, every every ounce of hardship, from, from real you know, Christian persecution to that annoying paper cut, um, can be a redemptive God moment looking forward to the better future that God has for you. And so even in the middle of your pain, like you can trust and hope in God. Like I think that's awesome. And today we're going to talk about God's plan. And how you can have hope that God actually has a plan for your life. And it's a good plan. You know, when I was in college, one of the, like, my first big, like, catastrophic um, driving errors. You know, this is before, I'm old enough to say, this is before GPSs and um, cell phones. Well, there were cell phones, but I certainly didn't have one. And I wouldn't have fit the box inside my trunk anyways. But I had gone in, in 2000, two, two, year was 2000. I went to Liberty University um, down in Lynchburg, Virginia, and we lived at that point on the coast of Massachusetts, which is 12 hours away from my parents. And so I stayed all semester, I never went home, but during Christmas, of course, you know, they shut the dorms down, they kick you out, I, was, I had to drive home. And so I was, a, I was an 18 year old, and it was, I was in my parents' 1996 Ford Taurus station wagon, uh, velvet red interior, faded gray exterior, 1986. Um, and so I, I got in that thing, and I, I went with a buddy that lived up in the Massachusetts area, and we, we pointed our car toward home. We left at about 8 o'clock at night, and we were going to drive through the night and get there. Well, uh, to get from Lynchburg to the highway we wanted to take, we had to go up and down a mountain, like everything in the middle of Virginia. And so we went up the mountain, went down the wrong way. And we, we went, and we started seeing signs for, like, Virginia Beach, and... Uh, and like Richmond, we're like, we are two hours off course. Just talking away, driving, two 18-year-olds, no, you know, no idea what's going on. We are two hours off course. So you, you know, you pull into a payphone, you pull out the you know the big old foldable maps at that point, and you you're like, where are we? Call mom, like guys, I think we're gonna trouble here. And so what happened was we were gonna go like up and around, nice easy highway driving, avoiding all the big cities, nice simple, like safe drive. Instead, where we were. We ended up driving through the middle of Washington, D.C., the middle of Philadelphia, the middle of New York City. I don't know how we ended up in the middle of New York City, but we were like downtown New York City. 
and then pushing our way back to Massachusetts. So what was supposed to be this nice, easy trip ended up being this, like, through the middle of some of the most populated and busiest cities in the eastern seaboard. You know, when I started thinking about it, life is like that, isn't it? We think we've got this destination we're going to, this nice, easy trip. Here is the straight line I'm going in my life. This, this is where I'm heading. And, and point A to point B is this nice, straight line. But what really happens is there's, you know, there's landmines, there's pools, there's kayaking involved. There's, there's all kinds of like just uh, life is more like this. And so when we get in those moments, you know, one of the, one of the things that, that leaves us when our relationship with God, one of the questions we ask is, wait, where are you, God? This is where I thought my life was going, but it keeps on doing this. Like, where are you? Do you have a plan for my life? Or, or do you care about where I am in my life right now? Like, if you find yourself in the middle of this you know, bad place, this bad season, or someplace you don't want to be and you didn't want to be, like, do you still love me and care for me, God, here? Or, God, is, is there hope that all this is going to work out in the end? Like, is there actually hope right now? Is this going to work out? Now, I, I'm a bit of a sarcastic guy, for those of you that know me. And, uh, and one of the things I like to joke around is that when, when things go bad in our family, or things go bad, I like, I like to smile and say, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. It doesn't feel like it sometimes, though, does it? It doesn't feel like it. So the question is, is that true? Does God love you and does God have a good plan for you? And that's what we're going to look at today. Is there a reason to hope in the plan of God? So if you've got a Bible on your phone or a hard copy, I encourage you to open it up. Um, one of the reasons why I preach through specific passages of the Bible is because I want you to see what I'm talking about. I want you to be able to look at the passage and say, oh, that's, that makes sense. Like, I, I'm not smart enough to come up with ideas on my own. I've got to turn to God's Word to, to teach us and to learn from and to find actually some, some real hope beyond just the trivial things that I could say. So Romans chapter 8, and we're going to be in verse 28. Just three power-packed verses that talk about God's plan. Some heavy theological terms in here. We're going to walk through with some grace, but powerful, powerful passages. Here's what it says, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. This is a powerful picture of God's plan for your life. But before we get into it more, I want to pray. God, thank you so much for giving us here this morning. Thank you for how you love us and, and how you do. Like we, in some of those hard seasons when it feels like there is no hope, we do, we joke and say, does God really have a plan for my life right now? Is it a good plan? Well, we know from these verses and from the rest of your word that you do have a good, you do have good in store for us and that you work together good for those who love you, who are called according to your purpose. And you're walking us a path from, from being known by you, being called by you, being made right by you and ultimately being glorified by you. So help us to walk that with joy in the hardest of seasons when it feels like we're, we want to be on this easy path, but it's not an easy path. When things seem chaotic, but help them to pull together and know that you are God and you are good and you are working a good plan as a good father would. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we kind of walk back through this passage, one of the, the big questions I want to say is, what do we know about God's plan? If God's plan is good, and if we can hope in God's plan, what do we know about it? Like, what can we believe about it? What can we, what can we kind of hold on to in the hard times of life or when it seems hopeless? How can we know for sure that God has a good plan? Because there are times when you are really hurting, like when you are really depressed or discouraged or just suffering with something or walking through just problem after problem and battle after battle, that you really wonder, is God's plan good? Like, is this plan good? And to even say God is good feels flippant. Feels like almost forced. So, so what do we know about God's plan? And is it a good plan? Here's the first thing we see. Very, the very first verse, the first thing we learn about God's plan is that God's plan really does lead you toward what is good. If we believe the word of God, the promises of God, and 
We have every reason to. If we believe the word of God, we know that we are heading to a good place according to God's plan. Look at verse 28 again. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. That God works all things together for good. That God is working all things together toward and leading toward what is good. Now, a couple years ago, and some of you guys were here when we had this story, about seven years ago, we made the process of moving to Maryland. And in the process of moving to Maryland, I put my family into absolute chaos. And, and just it was a chaotic time because we were trying to sell our house during a down economy time, which was dumping a lot of money into it that we didn't have. And then we were trying to get our house sold, and we were trying to get a house up here, all while having a two-and-a-half-year-old and a, a four-week-old baby. Now, we got an offer on our house. We took it. We didn't have a place to live yet, so we couch-hopped for about a month, driving back and forth from Virginia to here, and it was chaotic. It was hard. We, we were pen, pinching pennies to eat and put gas in the car. And you know, by the graciousness of people in our lives, we made it through in God's, God's grace. But it was a chaotic time. And, and I, don't, I, don't, I know that my wife, she, she's a gracious woman to me. But you know, having a four-week-old baby and not knowing where you're sleeping at night sometimes is an interesting situation. And so we kept on saying, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. Like, all this is working towards something that is good. We're going to find a house, we, we, and we purchased the house, and we're going to be able to move into that house soon. And we're going to have our own, we're going to have our space, we're going to have a bed, we're going to have some stability in our life. And so in the midst of that chaos, we look forward to the fact that we were on a trajectory towards something that was good. And I think that's kind of what we see in this picture here, that there are times when when your life feels like it's chaotic and, and you don't have a place, you don't feel like a home, you, you feel like this is going on, that's going on, and, and all of the puzzle pieces of your life, the various sections of your life, just they feel out of order and running the wrong way. But what God says in this verse is that I will work all things together, even the most chaotic pictures, the chaotic seasons of life, I will put all that together for good and for you are good. That, that's, a, that's a great promise. Now, this, this happens a lot behind the scenes, doesn't it? Like, we don't see all this happening. We don't, we don't see all the pieces. And sometimes we can look back and see the pieces of God and how God has worked together the good to get us to where we are and, and maybe even working to get us forward even beyond that. But, but I do believe that there will be a time when, we, when we're returning, we look back and say, wow, God, you orchestrated that. It's amazing. It doesn't feel like that in the moment. But we can know that God is working all things together for good. Now, there's two caveats. There's, there's two conditions here that we need to remember. There, there's two things that, that kind of God says. We, we come and forget that. We say, God works together all things for good. Then we forget that he says, for those who love God and who are called according to his purposes. Now, that's a pretty big condition here because God doesn't just work together good. He works together good for those who love God and who are called according to his purposes. That almost sounds a little bit mean of God, doesn't it? Well, you only work together good for those that love you? Like, what kind of mean thing is that? Or, don't you love everybody, God? Aren't you God of love? Well, I think here's what it's saying. When you and I love God, our definition of good changes. Does that make sense? Like, when we love God, when we, when we want to, to live for God and know God, our definition of, of what matters changes. You think differently about the world. You, you view things different. When God is first, other things are not. So like, when you love God, comfort is not as important as God. If you love comfort, then you know God is going to be second. If you love your job, God is going to be second. If you love your stuff, God is going to be second. So if you love comfort, not everything might work out for good, because sometimes God challenges our comfort. If you love your stuff, not everything might work out for good because God calls us to be people who give, not take. If you love your job, things might not work out good because jobs go away, but God's eternal. If you, if you, you probably have all these other things that you love more than God, then we're going to be in trouble because the world probably isn't going to work out for good. But if you love God, and God is leading you toward himself, to an eternity with him, with joy with him, to, to be more like his son, like that's good. That's good. And so if you love God, God is working these things together with good because he's leading you more and more to where he desires for your life. And so if you love God, you want to be where he is. You want to do what he wants. 
even when, even when it's hard, even when it's difficult. Then it says, those who are called according to his purposes. Meaning that if God has called you to follow after him, this is a salvation wording. If you follow after Jesus, this is, this is the plan that God's got you on. A good plan for your life. And So to kind of summarize all that, if you love God and you're saved by him and you're following after him, you can know that God is, is leading you a good place. He's, he's leading you someplace excellent, someplace good. And, and we're not going to see it fully right now, but we will see it in the future. I think Joseph is probably one of the best stories, and I wish I had time to really dig into the story of Joseph, but just to give you the, the cliff note version, Joseph lived, was in Deuteronomy, of Deuteronomy. He was in the Old Testament in Genesis, the end of Genesis. And um, as Joseph was, uh, Joseph was, was the favorite brother of, of 12 brothers, and he, the, he was the, that, the kind of the dad's favorite, so dad just like dumped onto him and propped him up, and his brothers hated him because of it. And Joseph was kind of a snob about it too, so it didn't work out very well for Joseph. So one day they were, they were out taking care of their stuff. Uh, they're away from home. And his brother said, you know what? Let's get this jerk out of here. Let's kill him. Let's, let's throw him in a hole and be done with him. But then they kind of backed away from that and said, let's just, let's just throw him in a hole. Well, let's just sell him into slavery. And so they sold their brother into slavery to Egypt. He gets thrown out of a caravan, goes to Egypt, and is, is brought, into the, brought into the service of somebody named Potiphar. And there in Potiphar's house, he kind of he works his way up. He gets some privileges. He's still a slave. Uh, he's still a you know, servant in that house. Still, you know, he's owned by his master. But yet he's beginning to kind of get more and more authority. God is blessing. Then all of a sudden he's accused of rape. And he's, he's put into prison, like dungeon prison. And so, you know, he goes up, he goes down, he goes up, he goes down. Then, you know, he interprets some, he interprets some dreams. People say, hey, remember me when you leave. People forget he's forgotten down there. All this happens. So... Later on, Joseph ends up interpreting Pharaoh's dream. Kind of, God uses Pharaoh and, and his dream to kind of point out that a, a great famine was coming after some blessing. So Joseph, through God's wisdom, lays out a plan to protect and save Egypt and others by storing grain and kind of pulling things aside. And then all of a sudden, using that when the years of famine came, so kind of like saving in the bank for a rainy day. And so Joseph kind of laid that out. So at the very end of Joseph, at, at the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, Joseph's brothers are pretty scared that, you know, they, they reunite, they, they forgive each other, but now there's, now Joseph's brother is scared, like, hey, we threw this guy into a hole, we wanted to kill him, we sold him into slavery, and now he's kind of like in charge of Egypt, we're going to die. Like, we're, he's going to kill us. Like, he's going he's gonna to get his revenge now. And here's what Joseph says. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about many people to be kept alive as they are today. He tells his brothers, what you meant for evil, God has worked all things together for good. And so if that happens with Joseph, you know that's happening in your life, that God is working together for good in your life. And we have to be those kind of people that say that God is taking these chaotic pieces of my life and he's leading me toward what is good. And so, so cling to that. I mean, like, hold on to that like a life vest in the middle of a stormy ocean. Like, cling to that hope that the, the chaos of your life, the storms, the difficulties, the, the directions, all the bumps and all the turns and all the twists and all the places that you didn't mean to, you didn't think you'd be and all the, all the difficulty, all those are leading toward God is working together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purposes. Cling to that hope. You know, embrace and live in that hope. It's a powerful hope. And so know that God's plan leads you toward what is good. The next thing we see here is that God's plan helps you become more like Jesus. Uh, I love this verse because we start to get to some heavy stuff. And I'm not going to dip deep into the theology of this. I want to keep this kind of focused on what we live and how we do this. But here is verse 29. He says, For those he foreknew, speaking of God, those that God foreknew... He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. You see that he, he foreknew, he also predestined so that they could be transformed or conformed into the picture of the image of Jesus Christ. Now those two words there, we have to kind of jump into them at least a little bit because those are some heavy words. And, let's be, and to be honest with you, they've caused a lot of debate among, among a lot of Christians. The word foreknew and predestined. Uh, are, are some of the most debated words in, in Christianity. What does that mean? Well, the word foreknew 
has this idea of God's knowledge. And it has this idea that, that God, before you were even born, knows you, calls you, works in your life. He has a special knowledge of you. And kind of foreknow. Like, so before you were born, God knew you. And this idea of predestined is this idea of what's called election, that, that God chose you for salvation. And, and the picture here that is often used is, is a whole bunch of people running toward a cliff. You know, blindly running toward a cliff. You know, thousands and thousands, millions and millions, of course, in our world, billions and billions of people running toward the cliff. And God pulling some back to safety. So, you know, I'm choosing, I'm pulling people to safety. This is a difficult concept because what happens is you go, well, well, who did God predestine? Like, did, did God predestine us or do we choose God? Do we choose God or does God choose us? And that's kind of where the debate falls in. And I'm kind of, I kind of find myself in the, you know, bouncing around and going, what does that mean? And I, I believe this. God, God is very much so active in our salvation. Now, I, I'm a mess. And I believe that without God's intervening help, I would never have known him. And I would be far a different person. And so I truly believe that God grabbed me and I was full steam ahead going off the cliff. But God in his mercy, not because I'm anything something or anything important, but God pulled me back. Helped me to see who Jesus was. Predestined me. But I also believe that I had a very real choice in that. Like I had a very real responsibility to to accept God's work and to believe in Him, and so so Paul uses these words: God God knows you, and God predestined or calls you. But but the per amongst all the debate, the purpose is clear. He says that to be conformed to the image of His Son, meaning, meaning the reason God pulled you back, the reason God calls you, the reason God knows you, is to make you like Jesus. Like that's God's goal: is to make you like Jesus. And so when you have that goal, that kind of sets up what we can expect out of God's plan. I'll give you an illustration. I, I coached Little League. Uh, not very, I'm not a very good coach, but, and I'm not a very good sports person, but I love, I love it. I love coaching six-year-old boys on, on the soccer field, which is just craziness across. I mean, it's, you think it's hurting cats if the cats were rabid, maybe, but it's not. It's, it's intense. And I love it. I coached, I coached eight-year-old girls in basketball, too. And... Whenever we, whenever we begin coaching, I always tell the parents, look, look here is my goal for this, this, here's my goal for this season. I want the kids to have fun. I want them to learn some skills, but I want them to come back next year. So my, my goal is to have fun, learn something, and come back. Now other coaches, their goal is we're going to win at all costs, which means I'm going to beat your kids into the ground. Like we're going to be running suicides. We're going to be we're going to be just pushing, pushing, pushing for points, points, points. And I don't care if they come back because we're going to win right here, right now. Six-year-old victory. My goal is to, that, that's my goal. That's that goal. And you coach differently, right? Like the plan's different, but it's different. God's plan for you is to become like Jesus. That means that your life, your plan might be a little bit different. You know, God's goal is not to make us successful, as much as it is to make us like Jesus. And sometimes that means success, and I really do believe if we follow Jesus' principles and God's principles, it will lead to a successful life at some level, but success does not mean BMWs in the parking lot. It doesn't mean uh, all these certain things. It means success in God's eyes. God, God's goal is to not make us popular, comfortable, or to build us a safe and secure life. God's goal is to make us like Jesus. You know what that means sometimes? It means we're not going to live a safe and secure life. Because in order for you to look like Jesus, sometimes you have to be trusting not in yourself in the safe little bubble, but in Jesus in the midst of chaos. Sometimes we become more like Jesus. God puts us in the crucible. He puts us in a pressure cooker so that we can become more like Jesus on the other side. Just like diamonds are refined under pressure. Just, just like cakes turn into cakes in the oven. God puts us through things sometimes because he loves us and he cares us. And he wants to make us like his son. It's not an angry thing. It's not a punishment thing. It's a loving thing. And so God says he foreknew us and he predestined us to become like Jesus. To, to become like his son. That's the benchmark. That's the goal of God in my life and in your life. And so here, here, here's why this matters. When you look at your life and you go, wow, this is not the plan I had for me. This hardship was not the hardship I wanted to go through. This difficulty, this, this redirection is not what I wanted to go through. Do you think there's any redirections with God? 
No. He's got you exactly where he wants you to become more like his son. And our choice is to walk forward in obedience. To, to learn what God wants us to learn there. To be transformed into Jesus Christ. And so I would encourage you, allow God to do that transforming work. The plan that God has on you, the good plan, is to look like Jesus Christ. His character, his qualities, his love. And how much... How much better would this society be if we truly took that as believers and said, I want to be like Jesus in my neighbor. Now, I'm not Jesus. You're not Jesus. So don't, don't get that wrong. Like We want to point people to Jesus. But if we live more like Christ and less like ourselves, that would probably be a pretty good thing. If we love people more like Jesus and, and less like we want to sometimes, that would probably be a good thing. So, so let Jesus do the transforming work. Let him, let him mold you and, and build you through the, through the various paths of your life. God is leading you toward that Christ-likeness to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, his Son. And by the way, how, how amazing is that? That God would take people like you and I, like, I'm nothing. I'm a, you know, I, I, wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to put my stamp on me. I barely want people to know me when I go to like the store. Like, don't, don't look at my hat on um, but God is willing to put the stamp of his son on us. That's powerful. And so the, the, the course of your life is leading you to be like Jesus. Here's the last thing. God is also leading you toward a secure future. But look, how, look how this verse ends. Verse 30. Those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. This, this picture right here now is, is the whole scope of what it takes to save you from, from before to the future. That God knew you before you were born. God looked at you and, and, and by merit, not of your own, but completely in his grace, called you, predestined you for salvation. He called you to know him and have a relationship and you answered that call. And when you answered that call, he justified you, which means that all of your sins, all the ways that you've walked away from God, all the wrong things you've done, the debt of your sin, he's paid in full. Just like we sang about. Now the curse of sin, the debt of sin, it's been paid in full by Jesus Christ. God is like a judge said, you're paid. You're innocent. And it's not because you're innocent, it's because it's been paid for in Jesus Christ. So God, God knew you and God called you and God made you right. And then it says God will glorify you. God glorified you, which means that sometime in the future when Christ comes back or when you go to be with him, there will be this moment when, when the rest of the brokenness, the rest of the sin, the rest of the, the hardship go away and you get to fully see who God has made you like Jesus Christ right now. Like, and in that moment, pain goes away, hope is there, and you are like Jesus. We seek glimpses of that now. But we'll see that fully later on. And so, so God is, God's plan is, is leading you there. It's leading you to that purpose. Now now notice, now I, I don't want to get heavy into grammar, but you, know, you, you think Paul's got a problem here, right? He's talking about future events. But he said predestined, past tense, called, past tense, justified, past tense, glorified, past tense. Last time I checked, I've not been glorified yet. When I woke up this morning, I was sore from yesterday. That is not what a glorified body does. I moaned and groaned to get out of bed like a 35-year-old old man. Um, I said, what is going on? For those of you who are not 35 are laughing at me. But I, I got out of bed, I'm like, this is not a glorified body, God. Uh, this is not a redeemed body. This is a sore body who did some silly things yesterday. I woke up with a sick stomach this morning. Want to know why? Because I ate five Krispy Kreme donuts yesterday, and I loved it. Um, that is not a glorified body. I'm not sure that, that might have been more refined sinful anyways, to be honest with you. But the reality is we are not glorified yet, but yet the passage says God also glorified. Paul is speaking with what's known as a prophetic past. Now I know this is like, what is going on grammar class? When the Old Testament prophets would, would predict what God was going to do, Oftentimes they would speak in past tense because that meant that God is going, it brings a certainty, right? It's done. It's, in God's world, it's already done. In God's mind, it's already happened. It's, it's over. So even though they're speaking of future events, they're saying God has done it already. Like this is certainly going to happen. 
And that's what's happening here. When, God, when Paul says that God justified and glorified you, this is done. It's something that God is going to secure, as God has secured. And so you can know that God sees this as done. This is the direction your life is heading. Now, there are specifics, there are details, there are other things, but this is the way God is leading you. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says this, He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. God is doing a good work in you. He's going to bring it to completion. I'm going to ask Pam if she's, how are you feeling good enough, Pam, yet? Yeah. Okay. Poor Pam, she's had like all kinds of stuff, like, We've, ever since we've launched this church, so many of our family has been sick. I, I, whenever I think about this verse, God works all things together for the good of those who love him, I think about Pam's story. Not because I'm involved in it, but I am. <laughs> but I want her to share, because I want you to hear from her how this works out in real life. The Guardian starts playing a lot to stop you. <laughs> That'll just be part of the story, right? Um, my star story starts in um, November of 2000 when this girl walked into my dorm room and said, I'm going to Kenya, Africa, and I want you to come with me. And I looked at her and I was like, you're crazy. <laughs> like, I'm not going. I had just gotten into my degree program. Like, I like was on my plan. I had, like, I knew exactly what I was doing. I had started dating a guy that wasn't Phil. Um, and I was like, this isn't, like, I'm not going, no way. And then God slowly started, like, putting things in my life. Like, first the Kenyan Children's Choir came, and they started singing, and I'm watching all these little kids sing, and I'm like, why can't I love these little kids? And then the guy broke up with me, and then um, I just, just through life, felt called to go. And so I went into a room, and I was like, okay, Kelly, we'll go, like we'll go to Kenya. So we started planning our trip, we found somebody to sponsor us, I called my mom, my mom said, you're not going. <laughs> I was like, wait a second, you've raised me my whole life to do this. She had raised my brother and I our whole lives to follow wherever God leads us. And so um, we hung up the phone and not very much longer later, my mom called me back and said, if this is what God wants you to do, then you need to go. So we kept moving forward. And um, the school actually put together a sponsor trip. So I wasn't just going as two college girls um, to the middle of nowhere. They actually put together a trip. So I went, ended up going with 13 other people, um, one of which was not the girl. Kelly decided not to go. So it was just me um, and a whole bunch of other strangers. Um, and so September of 2001, we arrived in Kenya, and we had been there about a week when September 11th happened. We were supposed to be there for nine months. It was supposed to be an entire school year, and we were going to set up an education program for an orphanage. Um, it's, their orphan system is a little different, that there are kids that live at the orphanage that actually have families. And because they have families, they can go to um, the school in the community. But those that don't have families have no one to sponsor them at the school. So we were setting up a program for those kids to have a way to learn. But when September 11th happened, everything shut down. Um, we were on the road from Somalia to Mombasa, both of those um, have high Muslim populations and high radical populations. So we were stuck in our house um, for two more weeks where they were trying to figure out how to get us home. Um, and I just felt so lost and in despair because I had a plan and I knew what I was doing and I knew what I was called to do. And I loved those kids, even though we'd only been there for a week, we loved those kids and we didn't want to come home. And I remember calling my dad just in despair because I was like, I don't want to come home. I don't want to do this. And my dad said, if God wants you there, he will keep you safe. And if he wants you to come home, it's going to be okay. And so we came home, and I felt lost from, um, we came home the end of September, and I didn't start school until January. And I just felt that, like that whole time just felt lost. Like, what am I supposed to do? And so I got back to school, and since we went to a Christian university, they require community service. So I went to the missions office, 
and said, you owe me. <laughs> like, all of this happened. I need, I need Christian service. And so they said, sure, you can file some papers. And so I started filing papers. And for a whole semester, every week, I would go in and file papers. It was the most boring job ever. But I actually had to stay into the summer for a summer class to kind of catch up my schedule. Like, well, you can stay part of the summer and you can work for us. And then um, like, you can come back next year. And next year we'll have a better job for you. And so I started working with actual missions teams, and I got to speak to students and encourage students to go on mission. And I got to go on more mission trips and go experience God in other places and share um, his love with orphans in China and um, Honduras and El Salvador and Brazil. Um, just it opened a door to go places I had never imagined. And then my senior year, I met this punk who I was trying to convince to go on a missions trip to England, and he did not think that was a good idea. And so we got into an argument. Um, but that argument led to a friendship, which led to a first date, which led to us getting married. So um, what started out as the most confusing time of my life has led to right here. Awesome. Thank you, Pam, for sharing that. <coughs> She hasn't been able to talk all week. Isn't that good that she could do that? <laughs> what I want you to see in that was that you don't always see God's plan. And even in that, you only see a fraction of God's plan. God is leading you on a good path. In the moment, it doesn't maybe feel like that, but trust God. Know Jesus and live for him, and he will lead you to what is good. What he sees as good, maybe not what you see as good, but what his good plan is for you. My hope this morning is that you do have a relationship with Jesus, that there's been a time in your life where you've made a decision to trust in him, to, to walk with him, to find forgiveness in Jesus Christ, realizing that you can't pay, you know, all the times you've walked away from God, and every single one of us has, you can't pay for that in and of yourself. I think God requires us to be perfect. We can't be that on our own. But yet in Jesus Christ, we can have forgiveness, we can have hope. And if you've never made a decision today, I hope that you will choose to follow Jesus Christ.